Good evening. Welcome to the latest Downing Street press conference. Let me first run you through the latest data on our coronavirus response. 4,786,219 tests for coronavirus have now been carried out or posted out in the UK, including 171,829 tests yesterday. 279,856 people have tested positive, and that's an increase of 1,871 cases since yesterday. 7,485 people are in hospital with COVID-19 in the UK, down 16% from 8,921 this time last week. And sadly, of those who tested positive for coronavirus across all settings, 39,728 have now died. That's an increase of 359 fatalities since yesterday, and once again, we are with their families in mourning. Now that the rate of transmission in the UK has fallen significantly from its peak, we need to take steps to manage the flare-ups and stop the virus from re-emerging. I want to update you on the progress we're making on three fronts to prevent a second wave of infections that could overwhelm the NHS. First, we've set up NHS test and trace in order to identify, contain and control the virus in the UK, thereby reducing its spread. As we move to the next stage of our fight against coronavirus, we'll be able to replace national lockdowns with individual isolation and, if necessary, local action where there are outbreaks. NHS test and trace will be vital to controlling the spread of the virus. It's how we will be able to protect our friends and family from infection and protect our NHS. And it does this by identifying anyone who's been in close contact with someone who's tested positive, asking them to isolate for 14 days in order to avoid unknowingly infecting others. And the system clearly relies on everyone playing their part. So I want to stress again today, we need you to get a test if you have coronavirus symptoms, a high temperature, a new continuous cough, or a loss of taste or smell. There is plenty of capacity, and everyone with symptoms is eligible. Every, everyone with symptoms. So please order a test from nhs.uk forward slash coronavirus as soon as you develop symptoms. And we need you to isolate yourself if a contact tracer tells you that you have been in contact with someone who's tested positive. NHS Test and Trace started operating a week ago, and already thousands of people are isolating who wouldn't have been doing so before this service was introduced. And they are thereby protecting others and reducing the spread of the virus. So while we're going to all these efforts here in the UK to control the virus, we must also ensure we don't re-import the virus from abroad. So the second action I want to update you on is the introduction of public health measures at the border. Today, the Home Secretary has brought forward the legislation needed to establish the new regime from Monday. And I want to explain the reasons for introducing these measures now. When coronavirus started to spread around the world, first from Wuhan and then from northern Italy and other areas, we introduced enhanced monitoring at the border in an attempt to stop the virus from gaining a foothold in the UK. These measures applied at various different times to arrivals from China, Japan, Iran and Italy and required people with symptoms travelling from those countries to self-isolate for 14 days. However, once community transmission was widespread within the UK, cases from abroad made up a tiny proportion of the total. At the same time, you'll remember, that international travel plummeted as countries around the world went into lockdown. So as a result, measures at the border were halted because they made little difference at the time in our fight against the virus. Now that we're getting the virus under control in the UK, 
there is a risk that cases from abroad begin once again to make up a greater proportion of overall cases. We therefore need to take steps now to manage that risk of these imported cases triggering a second peak. So just as we're asking people already in the, the UK to isolate for 14 days when contacted by NHS test and trace, we're also asking those arriving from abroad to isolate so that they don't unknowingly spread the virus. And there will be some exemptions for a limited number of people who need to cross the border, such as those engaged directly in the fight against coronavirus or who provide essential services. And we will review how the policy is working after three weeks. And of course, we will explore the possibility of international travel corridors with countries that have low risks of, low rates of infection, uh, but only when the evidence shows that it is safe to do so. The third point I want to make today is we need effective international action to reduce the impact of the virus across the globe. And this is the, the moment, really, for humanity to unite in the fight against the disease. Health experts have warned that if coronavirus is left to spread in developing countries, that could lead to future waves of infection coming back and uh, reaching the UK. While our amazing NHS has been there for everyone in this country who needs it, many developing countries have healthcare systems which are ill-prepared to manage this pandemic. So uh, to ensure that the world's poorest countries have the support they need to slow the spread of the virus, tomorrow I will open uh, the Global Vaccine Summit, hosted by the UK, and we'll bring together more than 50 countries and leading figures like Bill Gates to raise at least, at least $7.4 billion for Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. Over the next five years, with the UK's support as Gavi's biggest donor, this vaccine alliance aims to immunise a further 300 million children in the poorest countries against deadly diseases like polio, typhoid and measles, again, saving millions of lives. This support for routine immunisations will shore up poorer countries' healthcare systems to deal with coronavirus and so help to stop the global spread and, as I say, prevent a second wave of the virus reaching the UK. This virus has shown how connected we are. We're fighting uh, an invisible enemy and no one is safe, frankly, until we're all safe. And again, of course, this is all contingent upon each of us continuing to do our bit. And, uh, and, and as I never tire of telling you, let us not forget the basics. Wash your hands regularly and for 20 seconds. Wash your hands. Do not gather in groups of more than six outside. Always observe social distancing, keeping two metres apart from anyone outside your household. And I want to stress one final point, which uh, may be relevant uh, today, as the, as the weather threatens, I think, to take a turn for the worse. Some of you may be tempted to move the gatherings you've been enjoying outdoors, indoors, out of the rain. I really urge you, don't do that. We relax the rules on meeting outside for a very specific reason, because the evidence shows that the risks of transmission are much lower outdoors, much lower outdoors. And the risks of passing on the virus are significantly higher indoors, which is why gatherings uh, inside other people's homes are still prohibited. Breaking these rules now could undermine and reverse all the progress that we've made together. I've no doubt that that won't happen. I've no doubt that won't happen. I think the British public will continue to show the same resolve in fighting the virus as they have throughout this outbreak. We will get through this if we stay alert, control the virus, and in doing so, save lives. And with that, I'll now hand over to Patrick yeah, thank for today's you, slides. Minister. Can I have the first slide, please? This is uh, the slide of new cases, and uh, as you can see, there is a steady downward detection of new cases through testing. So as of today, 1,871 today. 
It's worth noting, though, that, as I've said before, this is picking up those who are tested. And what we estimate from the Office for National Statistics uh, household survey is the true number will be higher than this. And it could be somewhere around 8,000 a day. So this reinforces the point that we need to make sure we're picking up more people through testing to get closer to that number. The second thing to say is that because the R stays relatively close to one, that means that this is not coming down fast. And so we have relatively large numbers still not coming down fast. And I'll reiterate what I said last Thursday. That gives relatively little room for manoeuvre. It means we have to tread very cautiously as we go forward. But new cases are coming down. Next slide, please. As we've seen previously, that's reflected in admissions to hospital, also decreasing the slide for England there. And, of course, the number of people on mechanical ventilators in beds in hospital coming down across the four nations, but, as you will see, some variability with some ups and downs along the way. But everything moving in the right direction, slowly, but with a long tail. And, as I said, the number of cases remains relatively high, not coming down fast, and the R quite close to one. Next slide, please. The number of people in hospitals, of course, also coming down. Again, sharper in some places than other in terms of the decline, and with a relatively long tail, this will carry on for a little while longer. But the cases are coming down. And as you would expect, next slide, please. The number of deaths follows that pattern with, again, and this is good to see, a decrease which is going, coming day on day. But this also has this long tail. It's not coming down as fast as we'd like it to come down. It's likely to carry on for a bit longer. And it's worth reflecting that the people most affected by this have been the elderly, but also those from black, Asian, minority ethnic groups, as highlighted in the Public Health England report, and those with other risk factors, including other diseases, diabetes, and so on. So we need to keep vigilant. The numbers are in the right direction. Things are getting better. They are coming down. But we have to stick with the rules of distancing. We all have to do it. When we all do it, then we have a chance of getting this down further, which is what we need to do, especially over the summer, before we then reach another period in the winter. We're entering the winter with the, highest, uh, with the lowest numbers we can possibly get would be the best thing to do. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Patrick. Um, We'll go straight now to questions from the public, then to questions from the media. First to Amy uh, from Brighton. Spain recorded no new deaths over the last two days, despite a wide range of freedom across the country over the last three weeks, and new cases continue to fall. However, there has been no evidence of a second wave. Given this evidence, why is there concern over a second wave in the UK and how closely are the UK government liaising with the Spanish government? Uh, really excellent question. I mean, obviously, we're, we're learning everything we can from governments around the world. But I think probably I, I should defer to, to Patrick and Chris for uh, comment on epidemiology in, in Spain. Uh, well, it's, it's a great question, and it's fantastic news that numbers are coming down um, across Europe uh, and um, have come down to low levels in, in Spain. Uh, it's also the case that if you look in um, other countries, they are beginning to see outbreaks as um, measures are relaxed. That's true. We've seen outbreaks reported in South Korea. There have been outbreaks reported in parts of Germany as measures are relaxed. And so what's happened is that the first peak has been suppressed. And as the measures are released, there's a danger that that comes back. There's also a risk that there's a second peak that comes as a wave goes across the world. So we're not out of this yet. It is good news that as measures are being relaxed, people are generally seeing numbers continue to go down. And that is obviously what we would hope for here, that as the steps that are being taken cautiously and we're measuring, that we will continue to see numbers going down. Chris, I don't know if you want to add anything no, to that. Exactly. Thanks uh, very much. Question. Thanks, thanks. I mean, a very important thought there, though, that there could be a second wave across the, the world, as though the, 
the pandemic uh, you know has a, has its own kinetic force in it in itself it, it's possible that there could just be a second pulse of this disease that is possible in fact that's quite common. Yeah. So quite often with new epidemics, you get more than one wave before they're completely doing their bad work. So all, all the more reason to keep going with the, with, the, with the measures that we have. Can we go to Tony from, from Manchester? Tony from Manchester asks, myself and my husband are going back to work. Our children uh, are not in the age groups t to go back. Uh, what help is there uh, for parents with no childcare options? And uh, what, what I can say... Uh, Tony, I, I really do understand the, you know, how how you uh, feel. It is it is it is must be very frustrating that you know you're uh, you, you're not in the in the group of, of that are able to send their, their children back first. As, as everybody knows, it's it's early years uh, reception, uh, year one uh, and year six. Uh, but uh, we hope to get more primary school uh, children back. We we as, as you know, year ten and uh, year twelve are going to get some contact. With their teachers, the best the best we can do right now for you, Tony, is to is to keep supporting you uh, through the the furlough scheme, through the coronavirus job uh, retention scheme, uh, through all the ways that we've been uh, trying to uh, to help families. Uh, when it comes to specific uh, childcare options and what may uh, what may be available, uh, I I think you really need to uh, to look at our our coronavirus website and see what we're doing to support specifically with childcare. But what we are doing is doing a huge amount uh, to uh, to support families in terms of their, their income and their basic inability to go back to work. And as I said several times, you know, obviously employers have to be have to be reasonable. And if someone can't get uh, childcare, uh, then that is clearly a reason for them not to be able uh, to go back to work. But uh, we want to do everything we can to help you uh, with childcare uh, if we can. Anyway, um, we'll we'll try and we'll we'll try and get more schools back in in due course. But it is, I'm afraid, uh, all conditional on making progress in fighting that virus. Let's go to questions from journalists. Uh, Tom Burridge from the BBC. Uh, thank you very much, Prime Minister. Um, should anyone be booking a holiday anywhere in Europe right now? What's your assessment? Are holidays abroad this summer going to happen? And what do you say to someone who's paid the deposit on their holiday and now has to decide whether they pay the full amount or cancel? And two questions to the scientists, please. Um, can you honestly look the British public in the eye and tell them that if um, a quarantine like this had have been put in place uh, weeks ago, it would not have helped save lives. And also, um, did SAGE uh, recommend introducing these measures right now? Uh, right. Uh, Tom, first of all, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, to give advice on, on individuals' travel arrangements, but you know what the Foreign Office uh, guidance is. The, the guidance is that every, everybody at the moment should avoid uh, non-essential travel. Everybody should avoid non-essential travel. We've got to knock this virus uh, on the head. Um, uh, in terms of the, the quarantine uh, rules that we're, we're bringing in, uh, the reason for doing that, as I said just now, is we want to stop the possibility of, of reinfection from, from abroad. That's, the, that's uh, you know, the, the, a vital consideration uh, as we get the, the disease down. Uh, the, the sage advice from the experts in this area um, is that the measures like this are most effective when the incidence, the number of cases in this country is very low, and they're most effective when they're applied to countries with higher rates. That's the advice that was given from SAGE, and that's the advice that would have been true a few weeks ago, when obviously the levels were not very low here, and the transmission within the community was the highest source of infection. So uh, the recommendation that came from the science was that this measure of control is most effective at those times. I don't know, Chris, whether you want to add? Thanks very much, Tom. Let's go to Beth Rigby of Sky News. Thank you, Prime Minister. Tens of thousands of people have gathered in central London, many outside number 10 Downing Street, deeply upset and disturbed by the brutal killing of George, George Floyd. They don't have the chance to speak to the President of the United States, but you do. 
What is your message to President Trump on their behalf? And a question to the scientists, please. I've got the coronavirus alert system right here, and it says at level four, transmission is high and social distancing continues. And it says when we move to level three, there's a gradual easing of restrictions. So I'm a bit confused. We're at level four in terms of the alert level, but the relax relaxation of restrictions is already starting. Is that not a cause for concern? Um, well, f first of all, Beth, let me answer your question about, about George Floyd. And uh, we mourn uh, George Floyd, and I was appalled and, and sickened to, to see what, uh, what, what happened to him. And my message to, uh, to President Trump, to everybody in the United States from, uh, from the UK, is that I don't think racism or, or race, and I, it's an opinion that I'm sure is shared uh, by the overwhelming majority of, of people around the world. Well, racism, racist violence has no place uh, in our uh, society. And uh, you mentioned the the demonstrations, um, Beth. Uh, well, I, all I would say is that I do think uh, people have a right to protest, to make their feelings known about injustices such as uh, as what as what happened to to George Floyd. I, I would urge people to protest peacefully and in accordance with the rules on social distancing. Everybody's lives matter. Black lives matter, but we must fight this virus as well. Shall I take the second one? Yes. So uh, there were two separate things, which I think people are getting uh, conflated together. There's the alert level, uh, which is set uh, independently, uh, on the instruction of ministers independently, uh, by the uh, Joint Biosecurity Centre advising the four chief medical officers. Uh, and independently of that, and this is the thing that was linked to changes, were the five tests that ministers set that had to be met before changes could be made. And uh, those included things like protect, making, being sure that the NHS uh, could be protected and seeing sustained downward movement in deaths. There were, there were five of those. The alert levels are for a different purpose. And the point of the Joint Biosecurity bio Centre uh, is very much to try and uh, help us to map out in some detail across the UK over time. And it's only just beginning. Uh, the hotspots in the areas of the UK where things are moving uh, more quick, uh, at a higher level than elsewhere, to go back to Sir Patrick's earlier point, that as we move into a lower incidence across the country, we'll increasingly move from a situation where there is a lot of coronavirus everywhere in the country to a medium amount. We're trending downwards, and the alert levels were clear for, but with a direction of travel down. That was the uh, unanimous view of the four chief medical officers on the advice, independent advice, of the uh, Joint Bio Biosecurity Centre, JBC, uh, so uh, trending down. Uh, but really, we're going to move to a situation where we have a lower level, provided we all stick to the social distancing rules, and it's absolutely critical we do, and we take things very, very slowly for the reasons that Sir Patrick said right at the beginning. We've really got to take this slowly. We will get to a point where there will be much lower level everywhere, but we will start to get flare-ups and outbreaks in different parts of the country. And really what the JBC is primarily going to help us with is actually to identify early those areas of uh, increased transmission, those hotspots, so we can go in and try and find out how we can actually get on top of those before they spread more widely. This is very much something we've learnt from the first few months of this coronavirus. This is one of the critical things we need to do. Thanks. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, Robert Pesson from ITV. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, question for the Prime Minister first. Uh, your predecessor, Theresa May, uh, yesterday said she was deeply concerned by the way that the quarantines being imposed on travellers to the UK are, in her words, closing Britain off for the rest of the world. And she wants you to take the lead in developing an international aviation health screening standard that would make it unnecessary to have those kinds of uh, quarantines. Are, are you going to take your predecessor's advice and, and, and lead talks on devising such a scheme to get aviation going again, uh, travelling going again? Um, and to the chief scientific advisor and the chief medical officer, just picking up actually on what Beth uh, said, um, Professor, when he, one of the things you simply just said just now was that the point of the, 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 the threat levels 
was to basically advise, for example, on when we can have local lockdowns to tackle outbreaks at the local level. But one of the things we know from Dido Harding, for example, who's in charge of the whole test and trace process, is we're not going to have that data for another month, which makes many people concerned that the easing off of lockdown has happened a month too early. C could you just reassure or comment on that? Yeah, uh, first of all, thanks, Robert, on your point about uh, what we can do to make sure that, <clears throat> insofar as possible, we uh, allow people to, to fly safely. I, I mentioned uh, earlier on the, uh, the idea of, of, of safe corridors, safe travel uh, between the UK and other countries with uh, low uh, or, or, or similar <coughs> levels of, of infectivity, and, and we will certainly be uh, developing that as, as, we, as we go forward. One of the difficulties about, uh, about, about uh, testing is, is, as you know, the risk of, uh, of uh, at airports is, is the risk of false negatives. But um, uh, on, on, on the other matter, uh, Patrick, well, please, Chris. Um, I'm going to give, if I may, uh, quite a long answer to that, because I think it's a really critical question that people are asking. The thing to understand is this is a, uh, a, a, a disinfection with which we are going to have to live alongside for many months and probably longer than that. Uh, we basically got to have a multi-layered defence against it. Uh, and at any given point, we can maybe raise some things and lower others, but we're going to have to go incredibly cautiously, uh, as, uh, the, uh, as uh, Sir Patrick said early on. And I'm going to run through all the things that we have to do, because I think it's important to understand each change in context. So there are, there are a group of things we need to do to isolate those people who have the virus or might have the virus. And one of the problems with this virus is that it can be transmitted by people before they get symptoms. So the first and most important thing is people who do have symptoms must self-isolate straight away and they must get a test, as the Prime Minister was saying. Secondly, the people they are most likely to pass it on to and who could therefore have the virus without symptoms are their own household. So therefore their household must uh, isolate with them. And that has been the case right from the beginning of this epidemic. The new thing that has been brought in, and it is definitely, as you imply, in the early stages of its, uh, its development, but it is definitely there and is definitely working, but it'll work a lot better over time, uh, is the new element of test and trace. Because the third group of people who are likely to get this are people who've actually got a high amount or high chance of having the virus because they've come into close contact with someone with the virus and the test and trace NHS test and trace model is to allow us to identify the people who got cases and then identify their contacts and ask them to self-isolate because they may have these, this without uh, symptoms and pass it on. Then there's a group of things that we need, so that's the first group of things. Then there's a group of things we need to do in terms of reducing transmission at an individual level. And these include washing hands, as the Prime Minister repeatedly and rightly says, absolutely critical because you can pass it to yourself and to other people. Uh, if you're coughing, to make sure that you actually uh, have no good cough, what's called good cough etiquette, where you uh, use a tissue and dispose of it uh, properly. Um, the two metre rule, uh, which is about trying to ensure that if you do speak, cough, or make other uh, things which actually lead to droplets coming out and you're infected without knowing it, that you don't pass that on. And uh, something which, again, we brought in relatively recently, the idea that in, if you cannot socially distance at two metres uh, for a prolonged period, uh, for sorry, a moderately prolonged period, then you should use face cloths, and that's one of the things which... Uh, it's a new uh, thing. So those are, those are going to carry on really for as long as this, in fact, this epidemic continues. But then we've got the group of things which are around trying to break the link between households because that is where most of the social distancing come in and those are the things that were absolutely essential. Trying to reduce people's social contacts including close friends and family because actually very often those are the people who you will catch this from. Uh, all the things which bring people together, the things we all enjoy, like clubs, pubs, clubs, uh, and restaurants and so on, these are things where we needed to close those down. Um, uh, shops uh, were closed down as a way of ensuring that you came into contact with as few people uh, who were from different households. Uh, and, of course, the uh, initial uh, large but not complete closure of schools. Now, in this group of things, 
we've really made very, very small changes. With the exception of the schools, which has been a small uh, additional group to the people already at schools, the, uh, the children of essential workers, um, uh, almost all the other things are to do with people meeting outdoors and asked to be socially distant. And that's because the risk of people being outdoors is very considerably reduced. But these are really modest and slow steps. And the final two things that we have to do is shielding, keeping, making sure that the people who are at greatest risk are, uh, are away from the greatest risk of meeting others with the virus. And we made a very small adjustment to that, which is, again, because for many people this was incredibly difficult to maintain, to say, well, if you're just with a member of your existing household, you can go outdoors or you can meet someone, but at a distance, only one person, outdoors only. These changes in risk are really very small. And then the final one, which it really is important to stress, because it is in the long run the way we're going to get ourselves out of this, is research. Finding new drugs, finding new vaccines. Now, the reason I've listed all of those out is what we're making is small adjustments to some of these things, but this is a multi-layered defence, and all of us have parts to play in almost all of these. It's absolutely critical we all do this. And so we shouldn't take the fact that small adjustments are being made now to imply that this is suddenly locked down over. What this is, is a slight reversal of some of the most onerous things on people, mainly outdoors, at a socially uh, safe distance, the two metre distance. So I, hope that's, I know that's a long answer, but I think it is important to put things in context rather than just to see them as one-off events. Thanks very much, um, Robert. Tom Newton Dunn from The Sun. Thank you, Prime Minister. Question first to the CMO and the CSA, if they could possibly both answer this one. Uh, testing capacity, we know uh, Track and Trace is up and running. Could you say at what capacity it currently now is at? Is it 20%, 50%, 100%? We know it's not 100%, maybe. And when do you expect it to be running at full capacity, full operating uh, capacity? Uh, and before it gets to that stage, since Angela McLean has been very clear that uh, having a fully operating track and trace system is crucial to uh, unlocking the lockdown, are you comfortable for more measures to be released, such as the, the opening of shops or pubs or restaurants? And question to the Prime Minister. Um, Prime Minister, this is my last question to you as the Sun's political editor. Uh, it's now clear that the uh, nation will lose a whole load of jobs. Many millions of jobs may be lost by the autumn, by Christmas. Many of those will be sun readers, probably tens or even hundreds of thousands. Are you able to guarantee to these people, none of whom have lost their jobs through any fault of their own, either new jobs to all of them, or if not, help or training to all of them to be able to get new jobs again? Yes, uh, sorry, um, but, but why don't you answer the, the first one? I'll come to Tom. Um, on the testing capacity, um, in a sense what we've done is play leapfrog to some extent. The capacity goes up, then we uh, run to catch up. There are, there are very many more things we could do with testing with greater capacity. And the key thing we need to do is do that systematically. We obviously started off with people who had uh, severe disease, uh, went out by stages, uh, key workers, testing them if they had symptoms so they could go back to work in the NHS, social care and other areas. And we've now got to a situation where we can test people who've got symptoms in the general public and that allows us to run the test, NHS test and trace system, uh, which was not possible when we had less cap uh, testing capacity. Uh, but it, at the more capacity we have, the more different uses we can use for these testing for people who've got the virus now. And that allows us to do test screening, for example, in care homes, screening in hospitals, uh, and other things which will allow us to find the hot spots that we've got in terms of infection and, uh, and uh, deal with them. But you're absolutely right. We are not yet at sort of cruising altitude for this. Uh, the number of tests is going to carry on going up, uh, and our ability to use the tests we've got is going to carry on going up. And this is going to carry on for quite some time before we get to the point, I think, that we're all satisfied we've got to the point we need. There's the additional point, which I'm not going to go into the details of, unless you really want to on a follow-up, of antibody testing, which is an additional capacity we now have. And this can say reliably whether someone has had the infection several weeks ago, uh, but we don't know whether it tells us anything useful about immunity or anything of that sort. But that's the other form of testing, and we're increasing the ability to do both of those uh, across the UK. And just, just to add to that, um, 
what Angela said is that the, an effective system in place is an important part of going forward, is an important part of being able to release measures, and as Chris has said, it's being built up. But I do want to stress, it's not the single answer. So the idea that somehow having a test and trace system in containment absolves ourselves of all the other things we need to do is incorrect. We need to make sure that we carry on with the distancing and some of the other measures in place in order to control this. The lower the number of cases in the country, the more effective and the higher burden of load, as it were, can be carried by test and trace and, and making sure people isolate. But on its own, it's not the answer. It has to be part of the whole system. And uh, Tom, on your incredibly important point about uh, what's going to, to happen as, we, uh, as, 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 as the months go by and uh, the effect of this uh, recession starts to bite. Yeah, and let's be in no doubt, yeah, of course, I'm afraid, tragically, there will be many, many job losses. And that is just inevitable uh, it, because of the effect of uh, this virus on the economy and because of the uh, because of the of the of the, the shutdown that has taken place and all I all I can uh, say is that in dealing with that uh, that fallout from coronavirus we will be as activist and as interventionist as we have been uh, throughout the lockdown I, there's no other country in the world I think has has done as much or few others that have done as much as the UK in terms of putting our arms uh, around workers with the furlough scheme, looking after companies that have run into difficulties, helping in any way uh, that we can. We will be just as interventionist in the next phase, investing in the UK economy, investing in infrastructure, taking our country forward so that we bounce back as, as, as sharply and as, as decisively as we can. That's going to be our approach. One thing I, I, I want to say is that for young people in particular, for whom the, the, the risk is, uh, I think, uh, highest of losing jobs and then being out of work for a long time, I think it's going to be vital that we guarantee uh, apprenticeships uh, for, for young people. I think we must, must have a, a huge... We'll have to look after people across the board, but uh, young people in particular, uh, I believe, uh, should be guaranteed an apprenticeship. Thank you. Welcome uh, back. Uh, I didn't let anybody else back, uh, Tom. I'll be accused of favouritism, but we, I, I, you know, everybody is going to wish you well on your, on your next job. Uh, and uh, after your historic innings uh, as political editor of The Sun. Um, Steve Swinford of The Times. Uh, Prime Minister, China's role in this pandemic has been heavily criticised, and you personally raised concerns on our pages this morning about the impact of security laws in Hong Kong. Uh, do you think we can ever return to business as normal with China, and are you, as is being reported, now looking to remove Huawei from Britain's 5G network entirely from 2023? Um, and Sir Patrick, just a brief question. To come back from what Tom was saying earlier, you uh, seem to suggest that Sage previously provided advice on the impact of quarantine measures. Uh, did Sage provide specific advice on implementing those measures on June the 8th, as is being planned, and whether that would doing so would actually make a significant difference to the spread of coronavirus? And if it didn't, do you personally have a view on that? Um, well, first of all, on... Uh, on uh, on Hong Kong, I, I, I've said uh, what I've said, which is that uh, uh, you're, you're absolutely right, Steve. I do think that uh, what is happening now uh, is potentially going to be an infringement of the uh, the Sino-UK, Sino-British Agreement of 1987. It protects uh, political and civic freedoms uh, in Hong Kong. That uh, looks as though it could be very, very badly eroded by what is being proposed. And so what we're saying is that we want to hold out our hand, a hand of friendship and support and loyalty uh, to the people of Hong Kong. I think that's the right thing to do on, uh, on high-risk uh, vendors in our critical national infrastructure. Uh, well, uh, you, you know my views. I, I think we've got to make sure that we have solutions for the, for the UK that protect UK security, and that's what this government is going to achieve. But I want to stress one thing. Uh, to uh, I am a Sinophile. I believe I, I think I, I, I think China is an incredible country and an extraordinary civilization, and uh, I I deeply uh, disapprove of uh, anti-Chinese xenophobia, attacks on uh, people of Chinese appearance that uh, uh, we've seen in in, uh, in recent months. I, 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 I we, we must stamp out uh, such uh, such xenophobia. And I see absolutely no contradiction uh, with what I've, between what I've said earlier uh, about Hong Kong and about uh, high-risk vendors in critical national infrastructure and wanting a good 
uh, friendly, uh, clear-eyed uh, working relationship with China. And that's what this country uh, will have. Uh, again, I'll reiterate the advice that the experts from SAGE gave, which is that the uh, measures at the border are most effective when the incidence is very low in this country and when applied to countries which have higher incidence. And the judgment of, of that time, of course, is not something uh, uh, for us. It's something for politicians to make. And they make the policy and they make the timing decisions. But that's the advice that we gave in terms of the science of this. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, anyway, thank you. And can we go now to Josh Layton from the Coventry Evening Telegraph? To the Prime Minister, coronavirus has already taken a bigger toll on the UK than anywhere else in Europe. What specific reassurances can you give workers in Coventry, especially in the car manufacturing sector, sector, which you've been so keen to champion, that they won't suffer the worst economic fallout as well? And to Professor Whitty and Sir Patrick, many parents in Coventry and Warwickshire are telling us that they are refusing to send their children back to school at the moment. With everything we have heard this evening about the alert level and the prospect of local lockdowns, doesn't this cautious approach prove them right? Um, well, first, first of all, uh, on, on, uh, Josh, on your question about uh, what we're doing to support the uh, Coventry and the West Midlands, the, uh, a huge number of businesses have received uh, grant payments, about 42 million, I think, in, in Coventry alone. We're supporting uh, businesses, in, industry enterprise uh, in uh, the West Midlands, and I think 85% of eligible businesses uh, in Coventry in the West Midlands have received uh, funding. But just, you know, you mentioned the car sector. One thing we really want to to drive forward as we as we come out of uh, the epidemic, as we as we as we bounce back, I, I, I want to see a, a lot more uh, going into uh, green technology, green batteries, uh, uh, green uh, motor vehicles, low carbon motor vehicles of all kinds. And uh, we have, uh, for instance, give you one. We have just put 108 million into uh, the UK battery industrialisation. Uh, centre, which is due to open later this year. So uh, we see, we uh, and you know, the, the West Midlands was the home of the original automotive uh, revolution. Uh, that's where it all began, the internal combustion combustion engine. I, I, and it's already in the West Midlands, you see an incredible profusion of uh, brilliant low carbon uh, technology, uh, low carbon vehicles. That's what we uh, want to champion. Uh, that's the future. I mean, on. On children, uh, sorry, on, on parents not wanting to send their uh, children to school, uh, which I think anyone can understand why parents are thinking about this very hard. I'm going to give an answer in the way you would give an answer as a doctor, which is to say, if you're starting a drug, if you're re recommending an operation, if you're doing anything of that sort, you say, look, there are some things that are benefits and there are some things that are risks, and you've got to understand these, and you've got to understand when is the right time uh, where the risks and benefits uh, have some form of balancing out. And of course, and this is not my area of expertise, I'm making the general point, children not having their school education is a huge disadvantage to them potentially for the rest of their lives. Everyone would, I think, broadly accept that. Set against that are the downsides of going to school in an epidemic. And I think that I'm going to list out four. The first of which is the risk to children. Uh, and uh, I think that one of the things that is one of the few reassurances that we can give in this disease is that overall it looks as if children are much less likely than adults to get severe disease and probably less likely to get clinical disease, meaning symptoms, uh, of any sort. Uh, and uh, although there are tragically a very small number of deaths in children, and a slightly larger number of people who've had severe disease. Compared to adults, this is not a dangerous disease in the way that many other infections really pick out children. This disease does not. So this is not a disease which is, a, which is primarily of risk to children. Uh, the second thing is that parents of particularly primary school children are generally not in the age group, which is at high risk of getting severe problems with coronavirus. Now, there are, of course, there are people who've got particular high-risk medical conditions who are shielded at the moment, and in that situation, there's a different set of, uh, of concerns, uh, and there's very specific guidance for those uh, parents. But this is not an area in primary school where a very small proportion of parents of primary school children are in the, are in the age group where uh, there's high mortality or severe problems. Clearly, there is a very complicated balancing act for society 
in terms of the possibility of increasing the transmission uh, and on the one hand and depriving children of their education on the other and this is a very hard balancing act but this is you know this is where we're trying to as a society walk between two risks a risk to education and a risk to health and the rates of transmission are now much lower than they were at the point when schools were closed uh, and then the final thing that people obviously think about is grandparents and others who are potentially at risk and obviously there is a, an issue there which we need to think through uh, in certain cases and that's about people taking sensible decisions so I think, you know, I fully understand, as everyone would fully understand, people wanting to uh, think this through. But the point I want to go back to at the beginning is that the biggest concern uh, for people is going to be the health of their children. And this is a disease which can affect children, but is very unlikely to compared to adults. Thanks very much, uh, Chris. Can we go to Marco Varvello of Rayuno? Mark. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. Actually, I must thank you on behalf of the Foreign Press Association as well, which advocated for a while access to these daily briefings. And here we are. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Uh, my questions are about the quarantine, because it's not just a matter of summer holidays. Hundreds of thousands of European workers left the country because of the lockdown, because uh, uh, shop, uh, shopping center, restaurant, pizzeria, they're all closed, so no work anymore. Now they are ready to come back. Uh, so I just wonder, they are not uh, all uh, key workers in an NHS, but actually they are quite essential. If you think of any alternative, different way from the quarantine, health certificate or anything else. The second question, um, because you mentioned, the Home Secretary mentioned as well, uh, air bridges and travel uh, uh, corridors. Does it mean that the British government has got already ongoing bilateral negotiation with the single European countries and in case, which ones? Okay, well, uh, Marco, thank you very much. On the, on the air corridors, um, I don't want to go into the negotiations uh, that we're having, but clearly we're, all, we're, we're discussing uh, with our partners uh, around uh, the whole of Europe about, uh, about what, could, what could be done uh, uh, continuously, just as we've been uh, negotiating the whole time about uh, movements across borders. And it's, you know, it's one of the, the, the most uh, difficult things to, to get right. Um, uh, and what I'd say to, to our, our Italian uh, friends, it, it, Italian, uh, Italians who've been living and working in the UK who, who now want to, to come back, I say, come back. Uh, uh, you know, come back to, uh, 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 to London or, or to the UK, uh, but you've got to quarantine. And uh, I don't believe that, that that is, you know, everybody's been uh, been in lockdown for a, for a, for a long time. Uh, it's just an, it's an, I know it's an imposition, uh, but we've really got to defeat this virus. But we, we want you back. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, listen, I, can, I just want to, I want to wrap up by making, I want to repeat the, the key point of, of this, of this press conference. We are seeing continuous falls in uh, the disease, in deaths, in in incidents, and that's why we've been able uh, to take the very cautious steps that uh, that we have. We want to take some more steps uh, to unlock our society and try to get back to as normal as as possible. Uh, eventually, I would like to do such things as as reducing the the two meter rule, for instance. But all those changes, all that future progress, uh, depends entirely on our ability to keep. Uh, reducing the incidence and driving down that disease. And that depends on us following the basic rules, washing your hands, wash our hands, uh, self-isolate if you have symptoms, uh, take a test, and, of course, observe social distancing. Thank you all very much. We are beating uh, this disease, uh, and we will beat it together if everybody uh, works on it together. Thank you. <laughs>